and welcome to our first edition of the Getting to Know Goddard Speaker Series. My name is Leslie Scott, and I work in the Office of Communications. I'll be your moderator for today. This series is not only an opportunity for you to learn more about NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, one of 10 NASA centers located in Greenbelt, Maryland, but it's also an opportunity for you to meet some of the amazing people behind the work. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to mention that Q&A will take place after all speakers have presented. To ask a question, click the link in the About section just below the video. You can also vote up a question already in the queue. If that option isn't present, please consider opening your video in another browser. Chrome or Firefox may work best. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our five speakers for today. First, you'll hear from Rosa avalos Warren. Rosa is a human spaceflight mission manager, managing and overseeing concepts of operations, systems requirements, pre-mission integration, operations, and post-mission evaluation. She supports real-time flight operations for the International Space Station, ISS, cargo vehicles, and the Orion spacecraft, part of the Artemis program. She also worked on the SpaceX's Demo-2 mission and test flights, part of the commercial crew program. Before joining human spaceflight, Rosa worked as a project manager in launch and flight operations at NASA's Wallops Flight Facility where she provided telemetry and range support to Rocket Lab and multiple air surveillance, human exploration and operations mission directorate projects. Prior to Wallops, Rosa worked for Boeing and NASA Johnson Space Center, supporting the ISS program as a mechanical and operations engineer, in addition to a multitude of other engineering roles. The next speaker will be Kurt Suprop. Kurt serves as the Deputy Program Manager for Mission Communications within the agency's program, communications program, directly responsible for the management and operations of the NASA Ground Communication System, NASCOM, mission network. He is also the information system owner for the two NASCOM system security plans and a senior engineer in the mission networks division for the Information and Technology Directorate. Kurt has worked at NASA since 1985 and has held a wide variety of technical management and leadership positions in various fields of information technology, such as networking, telecommunications, software development, end user services, and strategic planning. He has led the development, deployment, evolution, and operation of the first center-wide electronic mail system, the first center-wide institutional data network project, the first agency-wide IP mission-critical data network, the center's desktop management strategy, and the agency communications program backbone strategy. Following Kurt will be Sam Schreiber. Sam is the Deputy Operations Director for Goddard's Flight Dynamics Facility. He started his career at NASA as a NASA contractor at NASA's Johnson Space Center, working for United Space Alliance in the Space Flight Training Division. There, he trained NASA astronauts on space shuttle guidance, propulsion, and control systems, as well as manual flight techniques in case of emergencies. After the retirement of the space shuttle, Sam moved to Washington, D.C. and worked as a flight dynamics engineer, delivering flight dynamics ground systems for both commercial and government space programs. In 2013, Sam began working in the flight dynamics facility as a NASA contractor, supporting both the human spaceflight team and navigation's operations team, which provides flight dynamic services for more than 30 spacecraft. In 2015, Sam became the operations manager for the facility and the new deputy operations director in 2019. After Kurt, you'll hear from Bob Jameson. As the deputy director for NASA's Wallops Flight Facility, Bob is responsible for the overall management and technical readiness of Wallops Flight Facility as well as the execution of Goddard's suborbital and special orbital projects. Bob has more than 30 years of experience in Department of Defense and at NASA in space operations, range operations, engineering and project management. Prior to assuming his current role in 2019, Bob served as chief of the Wallops Range and Missions Management Office, which runs NASA's only owned and operated launch range. Lastly, you'll hear from Cody Kelly. Cody currently serves as the Deputy for National Affairs in Goddard's Search and Rescue, or SAR, Mission Office. His responsibilities include organizing 
planning, directing, and assisting in coordinating the technical management of the SAR mission. Cody is a recognized authority for a wide range of SAR activities involving technology innovation and specializing in human spaceflight SAR applications. For the demo to and follow on missions, Cody serves as the SAR liaison to Goddard's human spaceflight networks, as well as an agency and national level liaison with civil and military rescue authorities supporting NASA's human space, space flight activities. Cody was honored by Popular Mechanics Magazine as one of 2017's Breakthrough Award winners for his work in the civilian and military satellite aided search and rescue community, one of many prestigious awards he's received throughout his career. Now, let's hear from Rosa. When we talk about the vision of the commercial crew program, I think of the endeavor of partnering and empowering commercial providers, ensuring the safe transportation of astronauts to and from the International Space Station, and overall furthering the capabilities of commercial space transportation. Next slide. And as far as how all the pieces come together is by collaboration between NASA and private industry, ensuring mission success while always, always, always prioritizing the safety of the crew members. In order to accomplish this, the mission and safety requirements are set. First, working closely to make sure that companies are continuing to develop a space vehicle that is safe, reliable, and cost effective. Also, by going through the different phases of design, testing, integration, and operation, NASA engineers have an insight into the different ways that companies' developments are proceeding. And these companies can lean on the technical expertise that, and resources that NASA has. Next slide. And now as part of Goddard and the human spaceflight communications and tracking network, we integrate the network elements into comprehensive services for crewed missions. By coordinating with these different network elements, we provide the data and voice communications between the crew and the spacecraft, working in the different teams to make sure that we track the spacecraft accurately and always thinking about nominal and of nominal scenarios. And in case of an emergency, we collaborate with the Eastern Range, part of the US Space Force, to perform independent ground-based orbit determination in the event of an of nominal condition and also integrating the search and rescue team, which helps provide responsive location services. Next slide. Through the space network, which is comprised of a constellation of geosynchronous tracking and data relay satellites, we provide near continuous communication for missions providing voice and data communications through the different phases of flight. And here we're talking about launch, dock, undock, re-entry, and splashdown. Next slide. Starting from pre-flight activities for demo two, the network as a whole ensured proper communication coverage throughout the different critical phases of the mission. The first launch attempt was scrubbed due to weather, and we followed procedures to make sure that we configured our launch support for May 30th, the uh, May 30th launch date. And our main focus was to ensure reliable and also robust communications with the crew, making sure that we're tracking the vehicle from the launch pad through rendezvous and the next phases. Next slide. After launching, the crew members named the DM2 spacecraft Endeavor, following the different burns, manual flight tests. When DM2 was in proximity operations to the International Space Station, the Crew Dragon used direct S-band data link for exchanging audio, video, and telemetry data through the C2V2, which is known as the Common Communication for Visiting Vehicle Systems. When docking occurred, the Dragon Endeavor vehicle 
went through a hardline umbilical connection and was routed to the International Space Station on board the communication system. Next slide. Bob Benkin and Doug Harley were welcomed aboard the International Space Station and they became members of the Expedition 63. They stayed on the space station for about 62 days where they completed tests on Crew Dragon and performed science research, including the completion of extravehicular activities and installing new batteries aboard the station. And while this was happening, the network ensured tracking and data relay satellite support during these different critical operations such as the spacewalks. Next slide. On August 2nd, the team supported the undock of the Endeavour spacecraft, where the network supported from pre-undock activities through splashdown, providing console support of these different critical phases through splashdown at Pensacola, Florida on August 4th, marking the first splashdown of an American crewed spacecraft in 45 years. As we look through the different capabilities that were put together as an integrated network and integrated team, we put ourselves in a position to be able to support nominal and unnominal situations and always being one step ahead. Through this experience, we'll continue to leverage the knowledge and transfer lessons learned from DM2 to the upcoming Crew-1 mission and in general, for all upcoming missions that the other mission managers and myself are working on, such as the Artemis Gateway and Human Landing Systems and on. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Kurt Suprock, as was mentioned in the earlier invitation, or in introduction, excuse me. Uh, and I'm the deputy program manager responsible for mission communications within the agency's communications program. Next slide. So, uh, the section, I'm going to go through a number of sections uh, in this presentation. And as we get through the presentation, I think we're going to start off with an overview of what NASCOM is. And I think by the time we get near the end of that presentation, you're going to have a pretty good view and understanding of what we did to support DM2 and what we will do to support uh, commercial crew in the future. So it's actually very fortunate that I followed Rose's presentation because you'll see how we fit within that overall network view. So next slide, please. As I mentioned, I'm going to do an overview of NASCOM, talk about the services and how we fit into the big picture of supporting uh, NASA's missions and specifically then how we supported NASA's SpaceX uh, as DM2 mission. Next slide, please. Next slide. All right, well, what is NASCOM? NASCOM is the agency's terrestrial communications network. Uh, we're basically a worldwide network that's responsible for providing communications to link together all of NASA's critical infrastructure. So Rosa talked a bit about uh, the space network and the other support entities that are tracking networks that uh, provide communications, space communications to all the satellites, uh, International Space Station and any crewed missions we have, as well as to satellites that are basically at other planets. So that's where the deep space network comes in. Our job is to basically tie together all of that infrastructure. We do the ground-based communications, wherever that infrastructure is, we bring that data back, we connect, bring it to the control centers, we bring it to the data centers, et cetera. Uh, so NASCOM, actually goes its roots back before the beginning of NASA. Uh, back in 1959, it actually started. So uh, contrary to popular rumor, I was not here at that time. I was not even born at that time. However, I was born when NASCOM was formed. Next slide, please. So this gives a little more detail on the uh, infrastructure that we support. Uh, the ground stations of those tracking networks that I mentioned, the flight project control centers, science operations centers. We also work with federal and international partners. We work with NOAA, we work with USGS, we work with uh, other uh, international um, space agencies, Japan, ES, ESA, et cetera. And you're gonna hear a little later about Flight Dynamics Facility. That's a key resource that we provide connections to. So we provide data, voice, video, and communications. And so to give you an idea of the kind of scale we're working at, at this point, NASCOM, we are actually supporting over 70 active NASA and other federal government spaceflight missions, 
the same time we're implementing their communications requirements for another 10 missions while working with another 45 spacecraft and instruments that are in various stages of life cycle development. Um, in that, we support 25 uh, mission critical support sites um, and we'll talk a little bit about where those are and kind of the diversity that we support in that. Next slide, please. Now, I jokingly call this the Goddard centric view of the universe because this was put together in a Goddard annual report and it shows a lot of the entities you're going to see. So when Rosa talked about the end to end connectivity, you see the, the tracking networks, you see the spacecraft going around, you see NASCOM in the middle highlighted colors chosen by my daughter. Uh, and it brings it back to the data centers so that science can be done with this work, so that data can be utilized. So there are two types of data that we primarily transport. Uh, there's the data associated with command and telemetry, which is the real-time mission critical, plus the data that is brought down through these tracking stations and then distributed around the science data, the results of the, the work, if you will. Next slide. This slide, now I also jokingly call the NASCOM centric view of the universe. It's just a graphic way of showing the different tracking networks that we interconnect, the launch facilities, science data centers, science operations centers. Now NASCOM is a worldwide network. Uh, we'll go over the number of sites that we connect. We provide data, voice and video services over that. Uh, but we do interconnect with what's known as our corporate network. That's the network that everybody uses for their email and their, their web streaming, et cetera. So um, we do have connectivity to that because folks do need to connect in and out, but it is firewalled and protected. But we are a standalone infrastructure and network. Next slide, please. I don't expect you guys to memorize this, but I did want to talk a little bit about the complexity uh, that when we're implementing real time mission critical infrastructure, you see a lot of the core sites that we connect here. This is by no means all of them, but this shows our backbone infrastructure. Um, when we're doing real time mission critical communications, we have to implement redundancy and diversity in it, which means we have multiple paths going into every location, multiple pieces of equipment. Uh, and then beyond that, we even have to check to make sure that when we get circuits from a commercial carrier, uh, that we are basically, you know, have true physical diversity end to end. Uh, that there is, the, you know, that they don't go over the same bridge that a single fiber cut can take it out. So next slide, please. I mentioned the number of sites we connect. Uh, you know, we have point to point sites again around the world. The tracking stations, the Deep Space Network are in Australia, Madrid, um, uh, and, and Goldstone, of course. Uh, we have near Earth network sites around the world. Plus, we go to universities and our foreign partners as well. Next slide. Our voice services. Uh, if you've watched any of the launches, you see the guys on their headsets, they're talking. That's Those are real time mission voice loops. Uh, and we operate the infrastructure and connectivity for that so that everybody can coordinate and make sure that they've got the communications and they're able to uh, talk to each other. So right now we've got about 4,000 key sets deployed across all the different sites that we support. Uh, and we manage 1,300 wide area voice loops. So this allows the folks that are doing the controllers, the mission managers like Rosa, to punch up who they need to talk to in real time, have those folks actually on the loop. So it's a very critical element in supporting the actual ongoing operations. Next slide. Uh, we operate all this out of two facilities at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, they are separated. They are fully capable of operating the network. And in fact, during the current COVID situation, we are a manned 7x24, 365 operation because of our worldwide commitments. We're using those two facilities in an alternate pattern uh, to make sure that we minimize interaction between the staff. And, and so far, the staff has been amazingly outstanding during this. Uh, um, we have not had any issues at all uh, in our support. And so uh, kudos to that team. Next slide. I touched upon these as we went through. Uh, we do have end to diversity for our real-time mission critical support. We have critical coverage periods, and on average, we support um, basically 35 missions annually in host center support. Um, next slide. And we also provide T monitor the TV uplinks in support of TV distribution to the networks. Next slide. All right, finally, as Rosa mentioned, we're part of that team that she mentioned that provides that communication. So we provided the terrestrial network to command links, as well as providing the data to the SpaceX control center, as you saw in all the mission critical voice loops. And I'll throw up one more slide before I wrap this up. Next slide, please. This final slide shows that integrated network and where we interconnect from a NASCOM perspective to all of those customers across the agency. 
Um, so at this point, that wraps up how we in NASCOM, who we are and how we supported SpaceX and how we will in the future support commercial crew as well as other human spaceflight. So with that, I will turn it over to Sam Schreiber from FDF. All right, thank you. Oh, my name is uh, Sam Schreiber. I'm the Deputy Operations Director for Goddard's Flight Dynamics Facility, or as we call it, the FDF. Next slide, please. The FDF is a critical NASA infrastructure that provides comprehensive flight dynamic services to space communication networks, as mentioned, to science missions, to human, space, uh, human exploration missions, and to launch vehicles. The FDF itself has actually been in existence for over 40 years, but its predecessor goes back to the Mercury and Gemini programs, and so we've actually been around in one, one one form or another since uh, the beginning of the space program. And we support all kinds of science missions, including uh, we supported the space shuttle, we supported the human, uh, Hubble Space Telescope, we're also gonna support James Webb Space Telescope, and we support the International Space Station and, and many more. But before we delve into how the FDF supports commercial crew, let's talk a little bit about what Flight Dynamics is. Um, flight Dynamics consists of three main processes, that's navigation, trajectory design, and acquisition. So to break those down a little bit further, Navigation is the process that answers the question, where am I? In, in fact, where was I? What does my orbit look like? What does my trajectory actually look like? This, um, this is the same process that happens uh, on your phone. You use your GPS, or if you're a little bit old school, if you go hiking and use a compass and an old fold-out map. But again, the idea here is to figure out where you are in space and time. Trajectory design answers the question, where do I want to go and how do I get there? Do I need to fire thrusters to change my orbit? Do I need to fly around the moon or slingshot around to get to Mars? Do I need to maneuver out of the way of some space garbage? Trajectory design is like figuring out what roads you want to get, uh, what roads you want to take to get from point A to point B on a road trip, and also determining if you have enough gas to get there. And then lastly is acquisition. This answers the question, how do I communicate with my spacecraft? How do, where do I point the antennas and when do I point them there? Some of those antennas could be on the ground looking up at the sky. Some of them can be in space pointing down. As Rosa mentioned, the Space Network's tracking data relay satellites, or as we call TDRS. So communications allows us to send signals to the spacecraft, allows us to get science data and spacecraft data down, and sometimes even allows us to take measurements of where the spacecraft is and how fast it's going. That helps us do a navigation process. The key here is that flight dynamics is a repetitive process. It's kind of just like forecasting the weather. The more you try and predict into the future, the less accurate your prediction is. We trust the weather forecast um, mostly for tomorrow, but maybe not so much for next week. So. For every spacecraft we support, we do this process every so often. Maybe it's every day, maybe it's once a week, maybe it's once a month. But that's how we ensure we know the spacecraft is, where it's going, and that uh, we can always talk to it. Next slide, please. From a big picture perspective, the support the FDF provides is that we ensure that all the tracking antennas, including the TDR satellites, uh, are actually pointing at crew capsules. Uh, we provide updated trajectories of the capsules to the antennas for the mission 24-7. We also perform trajectory analysis and evaluate how those antennas are performing. The key here is that the FDF ensures that, flight path, that the flight path the antennas are actually following actually match reality and what was predicted. Now, this is absolutely critical during launches and reentry to maintain communications with the crew. What you see here in these pictures is one of the TDRS's communication satellites pointing down toward, uh, toward the Earth and tracking the launch of the Dragon capsule as it hits different points along the East Coast. And on its way to Ireland. Next slide, please. So how does the FDF support human spaceflight? There are currently three main areas, the International Space Station, or ISS, the cargo vehicles, the Artemis program, and the commercial crew. And there's overlap between all of them. For example, we are back up to mission control for navigation. So in case mission control can't perform navigation for the ISS, we theoretically can take over. We also provide acquisition data 24-7, have communications with the ISS. So all those great live shots that we got on TV, the astronauts flipping around or doing uh, EVAs and spacewalks um, through the space network. We provide that information to the space network so they can point the antennas appropriately. We also provide the same service to all the cargo missions going to the ISS. For the Artemis program, we're providing the same critical acquisition data for the SLS rocket when it launches, as well as the Orion capsule that's on top of the SLS. We've also been assisting in the analysis of the lunar orbit of the upcoming Gateway Space Station. But when it comes to commercial crew, things get very interesting, and I'll go into that in the next few slides. The overview is that we do pre-mission communications analysis based upon something called launch escape. We're also in the operations room 24-7 from launch to docking and then from undocking to re-entry to provide updates to the tracking networks. And in the event of launch escape, we actually provide new trajectory information on a moment's notice if that were to happen. And then lastly, I'll mention the last slide about emergency navigation. We are there for that as well. Next slide, please. 
So these are just a few pictures of the mission at the F mission operations room supporting the launch of the M2 on May 30th, as well as reentry and splashdown of the historic mission. And yes, that is me in both pictures. And yes, I'm wearing the same shirt and tie, so don't judge. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about a launch abort, or as SpaceX calls it, a launch escape. In the event that something goes wrong while launching into orbit, a Dragon capsule on top of the Falcon gets yanked away very suddenly, and this allows the crew to escape. Also, it's obviously something we never want to happen. It's something we have to prepare for. So we developed some new tools and advanced some of our internal software and developed operations procedures to handle the situation so that we can maintain with the, uh, communications with the crew in this unlikely event. The question is, why do we have to do it this way? Well, Tedra satellites, again, those are the communication satellites in orbit pointing down, are talking to the Dragon capsule, and they have to do two things. They have to point at the trajectory and they have to listen to the correct frequency in the capsule. This is just like tuning your car radio. In order to hear the station you want, you gotta tune to the right frequency. What makes it more complicated is something that you might've heard of called the Doppler effect. If you ever heard of a siren of an ambulance driving by, you might've noticed that as it gets closer to you, the, the pitch goes up, and when it drives away from you, the siren the pitch goes down. And this is the Doppler effect. And the same thing happens with radio. So when the capsule suddenly is yanked off the top of the rocket, what happens? Suddenly where the rat capsule is headed has completely changed. But when also the, the, the velocity of the capsule has completely changed and thus the expected frequency that Tedris is actually listening for. So if this were to actually happen, the FDF is poised to update the antennas almost immediately based upon actual data we get live from the Dragon capsule based upon where it's going and how fast it's going there. As part of developing this concept, we literally took thousands of abort trajectories to determine what technique we would, live, we would use at a given time. Next slide, please. The last thing I'll talk about is emergency navigation. Uh, Rosa mentioned this a little bit. GPS has become pretty uh, widely spread in space navigation in low Earth orbit. Um, there are cases, though, where the GPS receiver on the capsule could have a failure. This has actually happened. Or in cases where um, a spacecraft failure can cause an issue where mission control can't continue to track the capsule. In this case, we work with the United States Air Force radar sites to help for us perform orbit determination of the crew capsule, orbit determination being the act of performing navigation on spacecraft. And once we determine what the spacecraft is, again, position, velocity at a given time, we send that information to mission control so they can continue recovering the spacecraft. And last slide, please. Finally, this is just simply a picture of the FDS mission operations room. This is about two thirds the size of the room. And this picture was taken just before the mask mandate came out in March due to COVID-19. We've been supporting uh, the operations room since then, obviously wearing masks and social distancing. And so this is probably the last picture of us in the ops room without masks. We continue to support um, with every mission that we do support on and uh, we're proud to do so. And that's all I had. I just wanna thank everybody for attending and listening today. So thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Um, I'm Bob Jamison, and I'm the Deputy Director for Wallops Flight Facility. So today, I um, wanted to take the opportunity to, to highlight our support for Demo2, but also some of the, uh, just explain to you some of the capabilities that, that Wallops brings to the table. Our past support for manned space flight, our future support for manned space flight, and again, some of the details for this Demo2 mission. So next slide, please. Um, if you're not familiar with Wallops, we're, we are part of Goddard Space Flight Center, but we're a separate entity and we're located on the eastern shore of Virginia. Um, obviously, great location there, not a, not a large population for doing launch operations and other suborbital testing. And, and that's really what Wallops is all about. We do suborbital testing for NASA. We're the only, we own and operate the only NASA launch range. And um, you see some of these images here that represent that. Um, the launch you see with the, the, the small rocket on the right of the screen, that's actually a sounding rocket. And uh, primarily we do, we do science where we can put a payload up into space for a short period of time, hundreds of miles up into space. It's also a great platform to, for developing those technologies that end up flying on uh, manned spacecraft. So uh, manned spacecraft and other spacecraft. Uh, additionally, you see the balloon in the center. We operate the balloon program all over the world and support that. And th these balloons keep the size of about say the uh, Superdome um, at, at float. And they can, they can hover above 100,000 feet for, for months and you can conduct science there. But again, you develop those technologies that end up flying in space. For example, um, systems that have ended up flying on the International Space Station were flo first flown on balloons. And you see the aircraft there, primarily again, doing airborne science for NASA. But um, just this year, 2020, we did a series of tests where we dropped simulated crew capsules, the next generation NASA crew capsule, out the back of the C-130, one of our C-130s, to test the parachutes, to make sure that the parachutes open properly, and um, you know, operate the way they're supposed to to return the crew safely to ground. 
And it, you see in the left there uh, an ELV launch, and this is just kind of represents our range where we operate a launch range worldwide. Um, and at Wallops, we do we do um, ELV launches that can meet anywhere from from resupplies to the International Space Station si to science missions to the moon. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said, we've been supporting um, human spaceflight for quite some time, going back all the way to 1959 in this example, where we did a series of eight launches of a, a vehicle called Little Joe. And um, Little Joe was the precursor for the Mercury mission, where again, you heard a little bit about this already, the, the launch abort system. In this case, we were testing the launch abort system for Mercury. Um, and so again, a suborbital flight, which is right up our, our alley, and also a development of that technology. So the technology was developed here for the Mercury uh, launch abort, and then actually flown with people down the Cape on, on the Mercury mission. So, so that's kind of, that, that really fits our niche. And you see the monkey there. Um, yeah, before, you know, back then, before you put astronauts on these systems, um, we, we put monkeys on them and tested them out. And that's, that was Sam and little Sam. They were named after School of Aviation Medicine in San Antonio. Uh, so a couple of those flights involved, involved live, live monkeys, just to make sure that the effects on the human body would be, would be acceptable for the astronauts. Uh, next slide, please. And so this, this one here, it, you know, jumping all the way forward to 2009, is kind of that modern version of that same test. In this case, we were testing what's called the Max Launch Abort System, or MLAS, uh, far more complex than Little Joe. But this was testing the launch abort for the Orion, which was supposed to fly in the Aries at that time. Um, and you can see it's, it, it made a lot of smoke and fire. And, and um, it was kind of like a nested Russian, uh, one of those nested Russian dolls, you know, where all, it would separate into multiple capsules and each one would, would, would deploy its own set of parachutes to slow it down uh, during reentry or, you know, back as it came back to Earth. You can kind of see a couple of those parachutes there. Um, but this was, uh, this was just very recently. And that same technology is what was then modified to what, what's flying today on different launch abort systems. Next slide, please. And so this, I, I kind of, I kind of mentioned a little bit. Um, this is our core mission at Wallops these days. I should say our, high, our our big highlighted mission, and that is the Antares resupplies to the space station. So uh, we fly these about twice a year, and we've been doing so since um, 2013. And we're on the 14th flight, um, actually just next week on September 29th at 10:27 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be flying. Uh, we'll be flying NG14 to resupply the space station. So. Um, this has been a very successful effort for us and obviously direct support. These, this is not flying astronauts, but it is supplying materials back to the space station. So the astronauts have everything they need to conduct the science, survive on station as well. So next slide. And, you know, just getting to really to the to this particular mission, we're talking about Demo 2, Wallops', is, Wallops is role here um, was to track, you know, when we were tracking both the launch vehicle as well as the Crew Dragon. And we're, we're ideally situated for those launches when they when they launch out of the Cape into a trajectory that um, you know that's similar to the space station or or going to the space station, it's a fairly northward trajectory. So we're well situated here at Wallops to pick up the downrange tracking after, from the Cape. So in this case, we were tracking telemetry and we fed that telemetry directly back to uh, SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, um, so they could get all that data real time and check on the health of the vehicle as well as that upper stage. Next slide, please. So as we look ahead, you know, we'll continue to support um, these types of activities from Wallops, but we know for certain we're a big part of what's going on with, with NASA's future, and that's with the Space Launch System and Artemis. In this case, our guys have the very tough duty of having to go to Bermuda, um, where we have a tracking station. So in, in, out in Bermuda, we have telemetry, we have command systems, and we have radar. And, uh, and we, we go out there, in the case of, of, of Artemis and, and SLS, we're going to be tracking um, telemetry. So we'll be we'll be collecting telemetry from that mid core station. It's absolutely required for these launches on SLS, um, and feeding that back to the Cape. And that that's a so this will be happening within the next couple of years. And and again, this will be NASA's direct support for for crewed crewed missions going forward. And that's all I have for Wallops. Thank you. Apologies. Howdy, everyone. Uh, my name is Cody Kelly. I currently serve as the Deputy for National Affairs within NASA's Search and Rescue Mission, off, mission Office here at Goddard. I'll talk to you a little bit about our support to the overall national SARSAT system, as well as our targeted support for SpaceX and our commercial crew programs, as well as the future work we're doing for Orion and Artemis 
both for ground-based recovery and some of the work we're doing for lunar search and rescue. So next slide. So a little bit of statistics and some of the NASA impact to the to the National Search and Rescue Program. Um, since January, we've uh, we've been successful in rescuing around 207 folks that may may have been lost or in distress. And last year in 2019, we we were instrumental in rescuing um, at least 422 uh, folks that were you know may have been a hiker, a mariner, or or a, or a pilot that became lost or in distress. Uh, NASA is a key part of the U.S. SARSAT program, as well as helping to set international search and rescue standards for both the, the ground, space, and user segment that has been, again, instrumental in rescuing over 48,000 people since 1982. Next slide. So NASA search and rescue, we touch all elements of the global search and rescue, search and rescue architecture really leaning back on NASA's expertise in system engineering, ground station development, and spacecraft operations. Um, we in the NASA SAR office have been, have been key working with our industry partners to develop new beacon waveforms, as well as working with our operational partners, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard and the U.S. Air Force, on the operational techniques and using advanced technologies to find those in distress, whether it's at sea in rough terrain or aircraft that have crashed or become lost. We work closely with the, the GPS program with the Air Force to put repeaters onto our, our satellite or space-based systems that can relay the, the location of a survivor to the search and rescue ground stations that can then send rescue forces to go to, to go find and rescue someone in distress. Next slide. So touching specifically on our support to human spaceflight programs, uh, we currently serve as an independent technical advisor within NASA for search and rescue matters. Um, we've worked directly with Boeing and SpaceX to, to help them understand their, their technical requirements for, for spacecraft transmissions, as well as working with the overall military and civil distress um, rescuing community to make sure that our human spaceflight programs are fully integrated into the current search and rescue architecture. Um, for the space station, whenever we launch a, a Soyuz capsule uh, from Russia, we provide uh, SAR coverage to give rescue forces the, the exact location if the Soyuz capsule had to have an abort or an off-nominal landing. And then for CCP or the Commercial Crew Program, we, we help um, both advocate and, and give enhance the technical content of the providers with our technical expertise in SARSAT beacon development and search and rescue engineering and system engineering to make sure that the, the spaceflight providers can compl comply with international COSPAS SARSAT requirements, which is the overall international governing body. Um, we also work with the industry team, uh, both NASA and industry, to understand the state of regulations and the engineering best practices to make sure they can comply with those standards. And then also, I have the best job in the world. We get to go out with the different commercial providers and our military forces to practice the techniques, tactics, procedures, and hardware that we would use to rescue our nation's astronauts. Next slide. So specifically for SpaceX uh, Demo 2, we worked with the Johnson Space Center here in Houston, supporting real-time operations um, from the, uh, the Goddard SAR Lab. So we had a direct connection to the landing support office here in Houston, as well as uh, the attachment three of the human spaceflight support um, with the, the military that was actually in charge of managing the forces that would go rescue the astronauts. Uh, we also worked on working up all of the post-landing operational concepts with SpaceX and the Flight Crew Operations Directorate at, at the Johnson Space Center to make sure that we were feeding the right data to the right people at the right time. Um, Goddard was key in this in having the actual antenna system and satellite scheduling software that's used to enhance a landing zone search and rescue coverage to make sure that we have a good connection between any kind of distress beacon and our ground stations that are helping supply data to SAR forces. Additionally, we worked with SpaceX directly with their engineering team to understand the current um, capabilities of their search and rescue beacon system on the, the Crew Dragon capsule, as well as characterize the performance so that it could meet the, the international uh, COSPAS SARSTAT requirements. And again, we're currently working with SpaceX and our other commercial crew providers to improve their beacon system performance, as well as more closely integrate search and rescue data into the decision-making process for human spaceflight. 
And then the, the top the top right picture, you can actually see the our building 28 with our six antennas that are used to track the the Cospa Sarsat satellites that provide that data to search and rescue forces. Next slide. So the the big the big reason we 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 become so involved, especially with commercial crew program, and now moving into the Orion and Artemis era, is that search and rescue is a key part of human spaceflight risk buy down and the capabilities to bring our astronauts home safe. Um, SAR controllers and the SAR forces they play an ever increasing role in the support of human spaceflight efforts for NASA. I'm coming out of the shuttle program. We've now transitioned to four different pathways to space whether it's Soyuz, SpaceX, Boeing, or Orion, and they all present unique challenges that we have to step up to as an opportunity for SAR, SAR engagement and SAR application of that data. Um, for example, you have varying landing zones, whether it's Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, Indian Ocean, Kazakhstan, or even the continental United States that really underscore the need to have timely and accurate uh, geolocation data in the event of an emergency. Like I said, for example, an astronaut may launch on a, a SpaceX rocket, which has abort profiles into the Indian Ocean, and then return back to Earth on a different capsule, which may land in the continental United States. So Goddard's key, key support becomes even more important as we go into these multiple pathways to the space station and destinations beyond low Earth orbit. Next slide. So we'll talk really quickly a little bit about the future and some of the stuff that we're working on that supports both commercial crew program and the Artemis generation, um, really enabling human spaceflight search and rescue across all of our NASA programs with taking the lessons we learned from DM2 and now getting ready for crew one and crew two. Next slide. One of the big applications that we're currently working on is the SAR Intelligent Terminal or SAINT. Um, it's a beacon display service for various NASA stakeholders that actually takes our search and rescue data from our Goddard ground station and provides it to SAR forces that are actively engaged in the human space flight by search and rescue effort. Um, it's also, we're also looking at extending it to external stakeholders and providing that real-time data to search and rescue forces based off of NASA collected and NASA managed SAR data. And that, again, that shows the, the impact of the Goddard SAR lab and the Goddard Space Flight Center in providing that data for all future uh, human spaceflight missions. And then next slide is the, the NASA Angel Beacon, which has been a project I've been working on for the last four, four and a half years, which will actually be a NASA designed or NASA developed with industry beacon that is worn on our Orion crew survival suits. So when we get ready to go for Artemis 2 to the moon and get ready to go into our beyond low Earth orbit uh, human spaceflight era, we'll be wearing the NASA Angel Beacons that were developed in, in accordance with our vendors, our commercial vendors, and the, the NASA Search and Rescue Mission Office to be worn on the spacesuits themselves when the astronauts come back. And NASA astronauts will be the first users of our, our SARSAT second generation beacons that provide enhanced accuracy and enhanced timeliness of SAR data to help find our astronauts anywhere in the world. And then the last slide, for more information, um, go go ahead and look online at the, the Exploration Space Communications Search and Rescue website, uh, esc.gsfc.nasa.gov, and then backslash SAR, and as well as the COSPAS SAR site website. And thank you, and I'll, I'll now pass, pass it on to Leslie. Well, thank you all for helping us gain a better understanding of Goddard's role in supporting the Demo2 mission and commercial crew program. Now we'll transition to the Q&A portion of the presentation. So I think you answered some of these questions during your presentation, but I'll ask it anyway, just in case someone tuned in late. What go or no go decisions were you able to make from your control center? Do you get, do you get to see Dragon information? And what information do you see about NASA networks? So I'm not sure who wants to take this question. Yeah, I, I can take that and then I'll I'll leave it open for, for anyone else that may want to, you know, provide more information. But um, so during the demo uh, to launch docking, undocking and splashdown, the network director and mission manager we were able to work from the network integration center, uh, integrating with the different network elements to make sure that we had a transparent uh, go decision as uh, the different network elements were looking into their systems and reporting their status their system status. And so as the network, we continuously receive updates from White Sands
students and from these different teams. So we receive the, you know, the most up to date information that helps us uh, provide also and um, feed into the different uh, FOD and JSC counterparts. Um, our next question we have is, what software was written or utilized at Garter for this mission? Have any of those applications been released as open source? Or Rosa or anyone else who wants I, to? I can definitely answer um, that question. As far as um, the software that, that was developed to enhance and strengthen, um, you know, our capabilities, uh, starting from cargo missions and also onto demo one, uh, the predecessor to demo two, and also the implied abort test um, uh, to make sure that we perfect our capabilities to support our potential abort scenarios. Um, so from that perspective, uh, that, that's what we have. And in terms of applications um, that have been released uh, via open source. Uh, given the proprietary nature um, of SpaceX, we follow guidelines and, and therefore are not released uh, to the general public. Um, uh, and uh, just in general, uh, for the person asking this question, I strongly recommend that they check out open source.gsfc.nasa.gov uh, for a list of open source projects. Thank you. All right. Um, so our next question for anyone who wants to take it, um, what technologies were developed at Goddard for this mission and have any of those technologies been patented and licensed? I can actually talk a little bit about that one. Um, so yeah, so so for the for this mission specifically for for DM2 and for all of our human spaceflight missions, uh, we we use these search and rescue satellite aided tracking beacons or SARSAT beacons that are typically first developed at Goddard and then kind of seeded out into industry with that standards development. And, and that's a to me is a key cornerstone of the commercialization and our impact on commercial industry where we can go through and develop the standards and some of the initial designs and then hand those off to industry to go take the commercialization and utilization for both human spaceflight and our search and rescue applications. Thank you. Um, our next question. I've heard that every astronaut heartbeat and voice goes through Goddard first. Was that true for Dragon? Hi, I, uh, I, I'm going to answer this and not because I was around when Apollo happened. Uh, but the uh, communications architecture has changed over over the decades, really, and how we design things. So this was definitely true in the early days of manned space flight. Uh, in fact, the first words of Neil Armstrong, you know, uh, one giant step for man, uh, uh, leap for mankind, actually came through the Goddard Space Flight Center first. Uh, before being passed on to Johnson. However, over the years, we've evolved that architecture. We've gotten the TDRS infrastructure in place. Um, so that data, as it comes down from the astronauts, uh, typically would go through one of our tracking networks. Uh, interestingly enough, White Sands, which is the primary sort uh, hub of the space network, the TDRS satellites to go around, is part organizationally of the Goddard Space Flight Center. So in a sense, as that data is coming down, it is going through GSFC first, not necessarily the Greenbelt, Maryland campus of GSFC. Uh, but then that comes down, it comes through the, the space network and goes over the communications of NASCOM to be delivered to where it needs to go, uh, either JSC mission control or hand it off to SpaceX in the case of the SpaceX DM2 missions. Thank you. Our next question, how has the pandemic changed how you support missions? I can chime in on that one, Leslie. Um, you know, speaking from from our standpoint, it changes everything about how we support missions. It's been uh, it's quite a challenge, right, in the new in the new uh, new environment to support missions. So, you know, just like we do a range readiness interview and a launch and you know ultimately a launch readiness interview for any mission um, that that flies out of wallets, we actually also now do a restart readiness review that that focuses strictly on our um, our approach to COVID and how we deal with that. And so. Um, that means that we do much of the work that we used to do on site. Nearly all of that from a planning perspective is done from home now. When we are on site, everybody's wearing a mask inside. We are always social distancing. Um, we've incorporated on our consoles. Nobody who, who doesn't absolutely have to be on a console is on console nowadays. 
And uh, we've also incorporated in those specific instances when we can't stay more than six feet apart, we've incorporated plexiglass positions between the consoles. But even on console, on the headsets, we have our folks in masks. Um, so it's made things harder, but we've been very effective, right? We conducted a launch, a Minotaur launch in July, and we'll be doing the Antares launch next week. And we also did this through, these, you know, through demo amongst other things. So very effective. We've been very effective under this under these new guidelines, but they have changed what we do quite a bit. It requires a lot of planning. Now, just add to that, one of the, the challenges we face, similar to what uh, Bob was describing, is as we've had to conduct work, uh, most recently we had to get a team up to Alaska to install uh, network connectivity to support some of the ground stations up there and some of the new requirements for projects. You know, we have to then juggle the differing uh, requirements that each of the states have. Um, and typically, you know, it's, it's you know, we, coming from Maryland, go into Alaska, you know, you have to get tests within three days, be clear, be there, be in quarantine. Uh, that impacts all of our work and our schedule. So we have to build that into our planning uh, to be, you know, able to meet the project's needs, need dates going forward. So uh, it also has a ripple effect because I have a limited number of installation engineers. They're then in quarantine. I can't use them for other work. So again, scheduling becomes very much of a challenge, but a lot of the uh, same requirements that, that Bob mentioned with regards to our operations teams, social distancing, wearing masks. Um, you know, we, we have the two ops facilities. We alternate between them at, at Greenbelt to make sure that, you know, as much as possible, we can limit that close interaction if we can. Thanks so much. Um, I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Um, the next question is, how will NASA mitigate the negative impacts on human psychology for deep space travel? I can start answering the question and letting Thank other you. other folks. So I believe that by already having a platform such as the International Space Station program, we are already learning a lot of the impacts on human psychology. And in the past, also having the long stay missions has been helping us um, develop and also learn more about, you know, how we're going to be going into the different programs uh, that are coming up with NASA. So uh, taking that uh, International Space Station um, you know, as an example, definitely sets um, the, the path for, you know, how we're going to be uh, moving forward and then learning about the negative um, impacts and, um, and the, the different researches that are being done there. Thank you. Okay, so I'll ask one more question um, for anyone who wants to take this one. What are the biggest challenges you face moving into a private-public partnership compared to the shuttle days? Uh, well, I can add one example of one of the challenges. Um, we, as I mentioned, we provide the mission voice communications, the voice loops between, uh, you know, the control centers, the launch facilities, et cetera, on the ground for coordination. And one of the requests we had early on, because we have multiple commercial crew partners we're working with, is that they wanted voice loops. And typically, these voice loops are very collaborative. You could have, you know, 100 people, different stations set up on it. You could, you know, pull in different groups. Um, they requested that their competitors, because essentially that's what they are, not be on the same voice loops with them. So that created a, a configuration challenge for us in that we had to create separate voice loops for SpaceX and a separate voice loops for, you know, Boeing. And but they were still talking to the same NASA people, the same NASA infrastructure and the folks that Rosa is overseeing in terms of all this uh, NASA support. Uh, so that was just one example of, of one of the challenges being within it, but not an insurmountable one. And it certainly brought a lot of energy and, and new directions and, and new ideas and capabilities to NASA. So it's very exciting to be a part of it. 